Hey, thank you so much for checking out today's video. I'm Pastor Matt, this is Pastor Adrienne, and we pray this message blesses you and encourages you all throughout your week. Absolutely. For any more information on how to be praying with us or to become a part of our community or to give, please head on over to takeovergera.com. Sure. Um, before I get started, I just like this right here, and I, I don't know, I just want to shout, I want to shout out Matt and Adrienne real quick. Um, I feel like I do that a lot, but whatever, I don't care. Um, I just want to shout them out real quick because like that right there, he doesn't have to do that. Um, Adrian, when I was standing over here before I came up, she came, she came over and she is just like, you want me to carry your stand up for you? And I was like, no, I, I can carry it up. It's fine. But she's like, okay, I just want to serve you. Dude, nobody, people don't do that. I don't know if you guys realize, like people don't do that. And we have something that's very rare. So Dude, I'm getting, I'm emotional this morning. I don't know what's going on. Nikki didn't even cry. And I'm still, like, I'm still about to lose it. So, man. Um, yeah, seriously. I know, seriously. Um, worship was great. I mean, how awesome was that? Seriously. Let's, uh, yeah, let's, let's give him a shout. Give, give God a shout of praise. Because that's, he, he is good and he's faithful. And, um, wow, I'm just blown away this morning already. Um, Anyways, I'm going to preach something, but I'm not just going to get up here and ramble all morning. So if you guys are taking notes, um, the title of my message this morning is Close the Gap. All right, we are in this series called Agreements, and uh, the, the title is Close the Gap. I'm going to be coming out of Genesis uh, 3, verses 1 through 13. Um, so, you know, if you're fo following along in your Bible or, you know, wherever, um, that's where we're coming out of. So this is, um, obviously, Genesis is the beginning of the Bible. It tell, tells the creation story. Okay, so this is coming um, out of chapter 3, where Adam and Eve have um, been created. They're in the garden, all right, and um, we're just going to start there, okay? So it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees of the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat, <clears throat> sorry, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for eating and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. When the eyes of both of, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of, God, of Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God because the tr uh, among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And the man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So we're just going to pray, and i um, just going to see how the Lord will use that, all right? Oh, Jesus, thank you for your word, and thank you for the lessons that it teaches us. Lord, we just pray that today as we are, we are gathered, we're hearing directly from your word, that you would just lay your spirit on our hearts, Lord. You would give us discernment. And you would just, first and foremost, use me as a mouthpiece of your word, Lord, that it would not be Scott that's speaking, that it would be you that is speaking here to all of us, and that you would do something through these words um, that would just be very, very powerful this morning, Lord. And we thank you for this opportunity to gather in your name. And we thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, has anybody ever been in a long-distance relationship before? You have? 
Couple? How, how far away were you? Five hours. How far away were you? To Brazil? That's pretty far. I've got you beat, though. So, ha. Huh, eat that. Eat that, Hamza. I've got you beat. Um, and everybody's like, this is stupid. It's not a competition. Well, you know what? Sometimes it is, all right? Everything's a competition. I'm very competitive. Ask Shani. Pray for her. She has to deal with me on game night because I'm coming for you when we play Catan, all right? So, anyways, that literally does not matter at all, but I have you all beat, so it does, so it does matter, all right? <laughs> but if you know Shani and I and, you, and you've heard our story, um, you know that she's not from here, right? Yeah. Even if you've don't know our story, but you've talked with her for a brief amount of time, um, you would know that she is from Australia, um, based on the amount of times that she says, oh, crikey, mate, or, you know, <laughs> throw another shrimp on the bobby. That's, she, <laughs> that's not a knife. This is, she thinks I'm an idiot, because I have literally never heard her say any of those things. She's probably never said them in her life. Um, but, yeah, oi, oi, that's it, yeah. Um, you should see her watch the Olympics, though. She gets excited about the Australians, I'll tell you that. Um, <laughs> stupid, that's so stupid. Um, but she is, even without all the catchphrases, she is from the land down under, all right? And it's awesome because I've had the chance to go visit a few times now, um, and, and I love it. Hopefully we'll go back soon because I love the, the culture, and I love the people and the food, and the coffee will change your life, all right? If you ever have the chance, I promise you, the coffee will change your life. It's so good. Um, but I absolutely love that country, and I love visiting. But one thing that I would change if I could, well, two things. Get rid of Vegemite, because it's disgusting. And she's going to, she's, it's a joke. She's going to kill me. Um, but no, the one thing that I would change is how, just how far away it is, right? Um, especially four years ago when we were, you know, doing this long distance relationship, the time it takes to get there, I would have done pretty much anything to change that because it was just so frustrating. Um, when you don't have your person around all the time, we don't, you know, even with, especially with that type of thing with the, the time change and everything where you have, you know, a limited amount of time during the day when you're actually even awake at the same time, it's just tough. It's very hard when there's, there's separation and there's distance there. And they say that distance makes the heart grow fonder, uh, but I'm not sure what idiot came up with that because um, that's not true, okay? Um, I don't know what, he doesn't, he doesn't know what he's talking about because how many of you know that distance a lot of times doesn't make the heart grow fonder, but distance will um, actually create doubt and confusion? A lot of times that's what happens, okay? Distance will distort your reality and distance... Uh, will will actually get you to believe lies over what you know to be true, okay? Um, now, obviously, we made it through our long-distance dating relationship uh, because my wife is just rock solid, and she's awesome, um, and I give her a lot of credit for that. But even in the strongest relationships like that, uh, when you throw in distance and, and separation, um, they, they kind of begin to fill your head with, with some doubt, right? right? Um, so this is just me being honest. Is it cool if I'm just vulnerable for a minute with y'all? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, because there were times when we were dating that I personally did allow thoughts to creep into my head because of that distance, because of how hard it was. Um, like what if she realizes that she doesn't want to move to America, right? Like what if she meets some buff Australian dude that's like... Hey, Sheila. And he's got his khaki shorts and his work boots on, and he's just ripped. And then she's like, hey, I'm not going to America, you know? That, I mean, those thoughts enter in. Or, like, if she doesn't call me when she said she would, and then I'm like, oh, what did I do? Like, oh, crap. Like, I'm, I'm in trouble now, you know? Like, that kind of stuff. It's, it's stupid, insecure stuff that would just start to creep in sometimes if I allowed it to, to, to make its way in. Um, now, in reality, like I said, she is rock solid. I mean, she is the most rock solid woman I've ever met in my life. Um, that's what I know to be true about Chantel Louise Funky, coolest, middle, coolest maiden name in the game, by the way. Um, but that's what I know to be true about her, right? But with some distance thrown in the mix, um, that really sets the stage for doubt and confusion to enter in. And it gets us to question 
the things that we are very sure of. Okay, and that relates uh, to Genesis chapter 3 so well uh, because God, he creates Adam and Eve and he gives them free reign over the entire Garden of Eden, right? He, he gives them free reign over everything. Literally, there is one rule. You don't eat from that one tree or you die. And that is, that's the one rule. Everything else, I mean, other than that, it's, it's, everything's fair game, you know? He, he, it, and it's perfect. It's, it's, it's insane. Like, it's literally insane. Um, it's all perfect. It's all theirs. They have total access to everything. And they're living this perfect life in this perfect place. And then the serpent enters the story, okay? Satan shows up. And he starts to throw some lies out to Eve. All right, he starts chirping in her ear. And let's, let's, be, let's be real here, okay? That's not the problem because that's not out of the ordinary for Satan. Right, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy everything. So that's not out of the ordinary for him. But the problem here is that Eve gives him her ear. She starts to listen. She allows some distance to grow in her heart between her and God. She allows this gap. And that's when the truth that she knows about God starts to become a little, a little cloudy. Okay? Because one of the best pieces of advice that I've ever been given by my amazing pastors is to always remember what you know is true about someone. Okay? Always remember what you know is true about someone. And I remind this to, to guys when I'm, I'm doing like, you know, helping somebody through a tough time in their relationship or their marriage. I, 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 99% of the time I will throw this out there is always remember what you know to be true about your spouse. Okay, and it doesn't have to be a spouse. It can be a friend, a parent, a sibling, whoever. It, it doesn't matter who it is. But always remember what you know about that person's heart and what you know to be true about them. Okay, um, you know when things get heated between you and your spouse, don't automatically assume the worst thing possible, because you know who they are. You know their heart for you. They married you for a reason. They love you, right? We, we, like, because that's such a human thing to do is just to jump to the first conclusion in our mind is like always the worst thing. So we need to be careful of that. You know, I mean, when you feel hurt by a parent or a friend, same thing. Remember what you know to be true about them. Don't let the lies that creep in speak louder than the truth that you know about that person. Okay? When your pastors let you down, when they say something stupid, because we will, because we're, we're human, we make mistakes. We're not Jesus, all right? When your pastors let you down. You know, it's, Matt was supposed to call me back at 3 o'clock, and it's 3.07, and he doesn't care about my problems. Nothing, it, he, does, he doesn't care about me at all. Are you remembering what you know to be true about Matt and about his heart? Are you remembering what you know to be true about Adrienne and her heart and how much she cares for you? Or are we allowing some untruths to creep in in those situations when we get frustrated with people for not doing what we expect them to do? Because that's the same thing that is happening with Eve here. Some untruths are creeping in. Some lies are starting to creep in. And I say creep in very intentionally, okay? Because the serpent is crafty. It says he is more crafty than any other wild animal the Lord made. He's good at what he does. And he starts off with something that is just so outrageous that it can't possibly be true. But it gets Eve's ear, okay? He says, did God really say that you can't eat from any tree in the garden? Did he really say that? Is that, that can't be true. And then what, what does Eve do? She gives him her ear. She responds. She's like, "What? no, that's not what he said. God said that, you know, we, we can't eat from that one tree over here, but otherwise, like, we can eat from whatever tree we want. That's fine. We just can't eat from that one or, you know, we'll die. That's fine. That's, you know, that's it. Um, so then after that, the serpent has her ear. He comes back with another lie, but this one's a little more subtle. It's a little more believable. He's like, w die? What? Like, surely you're not going to die if you eat from that tree. God just doesn't want you to be on his level. He just doesn't want you to know what he knows because once you do that, you, you'll be just like God. You'll be a God. You'll know everything. The devil is crafty, man. I'm telling you, he is crafty. He knows 
humans. He knows that Eve has an ego. He knows that Scott has an ego. He knows that Matt has a little bit of pride. Knows that people love to hear good things about themselves. He knows that people love things that, that build us up, that make us feel important, that make us feel good about ourselves. But those things ultimately create that separation from the Lord. So that's exactly what he's doing with Eve here. He touches on her ego, gives her, gives her something, you know, this, this could be you. You could be God-like. And instead of going to God, instead of actually speaking with God and just asking, is this true, Lord? Because this, this serpent has thrown out some stuff about, about this tree that's wild, that doesn't line up with, with what you've told us before. It's not what I know to be true about you, but he's saying this thing. What's up with this tree? She doesn't do that, okay? Instead of doing that, Eve starts to believe this crafty serpent, and she slowly makes an agreement inside her own heart that God really has been lying to us this whole time because he's trying to hold us back. He doesn't want us to be on his level. She disregards what she knows is true about God and his heart for her, and she eats the fruit from the tree anyways. And she gives some to to Adam, um, who, for the record, is standing right there watching her do this, okay? So by no means is this bro innocent, okay? He's not innocent at all, okay? He's standing there, and I just, I just, I imagine Adam just standing there like, I mean, yeah, if you think it's a good idea, go for it. I mean, I'll I'll definitely take a bite. You just take a bite first, and we'll see what happens. Um, If you... If you drop dead, then I mean, I, maybe I won't eat it, but I'll, I'll definitely eat it after you're done. Like, just go for it. Like, husbands, that right there is a whole sermon on its own, okay? Um, first biblical example of just a husband straight up dropping the ball when it comes to leadership, okay? Um, sorry for, okay, that's a si- sorry for the sidebar, but that's, lead your spouse well, okay? Let's do that. But back, back to it, back to the story here, okay? So now they've both eaten from the tree, all right? And it says that their eyes are opened and they realize that they're naked. They, they understand their nakedness now when before it wasn't an issue. Because the serpent deceived them into thinking that they would be gods themselves. But instead, they went from being perfect and in a perfect place and, a, and, and sinless, living this perfect life being in sync with a perfect God to being stripped of their security and covered in shame. That's what happens there. So much so that when they hear God walking through the garden, they hide themselves because of the amount of shame that they're carrying on them. And every time I read that story, I think, how silly, how foolish. Like, you th- like okay, see how that works out for you. You're gonna, you think you're going to hide from God? That's stupid stupid like you like you think that you can hide what you've done from the lord but we do the exact same thing all the time and think that we can get away with it all the time the promises the, that the world feeds feeds us are deception and lies and we fall for it constantly we we eat the fruit that the world is offering and then we become overwhelmed with guilt and shame and then we ourselves try to hide from the lord But what that does, the only thing that that does is that creates that separation between us. It creates a larger gap, which, again, in turn, it allows for doubt and confusion to enter in, okay? I cannot tell you how many times I've heard somebody say, if I was to step foot inside of a church, I'd burst into flames. Have you heard that before? I've heard plenty of people say that because that's the lie that people believe that what I've done is too much for the Lord to forgive, is too much for him to overcome. And if I stepped into church, I I would drop dead because I'm not good enough to be in that spot. It's crazy. Like, we don't want God to see us like that. Guess what? He already sees you. He already knows. He knows everything that you've ever done, everything you ever will do. It doesn't matter. He already knows. But the most amazing part of Jesus when he went and died on the cross and he rose back to life and he defeated death, sin, hell, the grave, is that he closed that gap for us when he did that. 
He defeated shame and guilt and nakedness. He defeated it all. He defeated any need for us to hide ourselves from him ever. And we're in this series, Agreements, and we're talking about the agreements that we as humans make with the world around us or the agreements that we make with our sin. You know, we're today we're talking about the agreements that Eve made with the serpent. When Jesus went to the cross, he made an agreement. He made the ultimate agreement with us. And let me tell you, that agreement that he made with us is so insanely lopsided. It's unfair. The scales are tilted so far in our favor. No sane business person on earth would ever make that deal to be on his end. Right? No, nobody would. Like, Donald Trump ain't going to be up here asking about, like, trying to make a deal for that. No way. Like, it's, it's just insane. He took the pain and the suffering and the torture and the heartbreak. He took it all. And in return, he gave us freedom and joy and eternal life with him. Like, that, that's tilted lopsided if I've ever seen it. And, the, and the, the craziest part about it is the only thing that we need to do is that we, just, we need to, t- to take him at his word and the deal's already done. We take him at his word and it's already completed. That deal is sealed. It's literally so simple, but we as humans just love to make things complicated and harder than, than, they, need, than they need to be. Like it's just, that's just what humans do. We make everything more difficult. Okay, And like we talked about earlier, we, we allow the sin and the lies to work their way into our lives. And you know, we can easily forget the passion that we felt when we first believed. Like I had, that, I had that thought as I was prepping, like, man, how awesome is that feeling when you first meet Jesus? Like how on fire are you? Like you just, man, like my God is so awesome. I need to tell everybody. Everybody needs to know. Like I'll do anything for this guy. Like this is so sick. He just, he saved me. It's awesome. But then over time, we, we allow our day-to-day lives and our problems to become a greater focus than Jesus and what he's done for us. The agreement that he made for us, it's just we allow ourselves to become made greater. So the question I have today is how can we purposefully remember what we know to be true about the Lord? How can we do that? What can we do to ensure that we don't allow ourselves to pull back from God and create that gap on our end. Because let's not get it twisted. He never has created the gap. When when there's any separation, when we feel like there's separation between us and the Lord, that's us. He's never left us or forsaken us. That's us feeling like we're pulling away. It's always us. So how, Pastor Scott? How do we close that gap? It's pretty easy house way it's pretty easy because he's already closed it for us there's no there's no need for us to do anything except take him at his word what i want to what i want us to realize today is we can't let our relationship with jesus be a long distance relationship okay there's a reason why long distance relationships are very hard and a lot of them don't work out is because they are just difficult to communicate. We can't let our relationship with Jesus be a a long distance relationship, all right? So the goal in our personal relationship with Jesus should be this, to be so in step with the Holy Spirit that it's natural to experience the supernatural, okay? We should be so in step with the Holy Spirit that it's natural for us to experience supernatural things, okay? I don't want to feel like it's difficult to talk to my Savior. Uh, What kind of God is that? Our God is not a far-off God. He's a God of love and relationship, and he wants to be in constant communication with us. All right, so so in, in that same vein, when we stay prayed up, when we stay in the Word, when we have our spirit built up, it's so much easier to communicate with him. We stay built up in the spirit. We will have no doubt as to what the Lord is saying to us. When he speaks to us, we'll know his voice. We'll understand it. And we'll, he'll give us, we call it discernment, as to, you know, on the other side of that coin, sometimes we hear things that might not be from the spirit. They might be from our flesh. 
He gives us that discernment when we're built up in the spirit to understand the difference in what he's telling us. All right, that, that's how right there. And the worship team, you guys can make your way back up here. Um, but this, this is my, my charge for us as a church today is that for, for far too long, the, the church at large, I'm not speaking about us directly, but the church at large has been so reliant on pastors and leadership as being the ones who are hearing from the Lord, okay? For far too long, it's been enough to come into church on a Sunday morning and just check off the attendance box and then walk out the door, go about our daily lives, and leave Jesus behind that door. Like, this is the only place he can dwell. That's, that's been going on for far too long in the church at large, okay? But hearing from God was never intended for a select few who are ordained. That's, it's never been intended to be that way, all right? In John 10, 27 through 28, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. It doesn't say the pastors hear my voice and I know them. That's, it doesn't say that. It says my sheep hear my voice and I know them. Now in today's culture, I know uh, being called a sheep can be somewhat of a political insult to some people, all right? But biblically, it has a whole different meaning. So I'll, I'll, I'll be called a sheep all day long. That's fine. Back when I was in middle school, I used to go to the summer camp, and we literally sang a song called, I Just Want to Be a Sheep. Now, he knows. I, of course Evan knows. Camp kids, let's go. Um, I went to a skate camp, though, so mine was really cool. So I was, I was shredding all the time. Um, and I, I know I said I'd never sing up here again, but... I feel like I have to sing it. So this song, this song would go, I just want to be a sheep, ba 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 ba. I just want to be a sheep, ba 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 ba. From my head down to my feet, my woolly little feet. I just want to be a sheep. And there was a line that was like, I don't, it was like, I don't want to be a Pharisee, because they're not fair, you see. Like, oh yeah, it was good. It was good. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Now, obviously, that is a, that's a silly kid song. It's cheesy. I get it. But there's a purpose behind that song and the reason that they were using that for the kids to get that on the inside of us because his sheep will hear his voice. His sheep will hear his voice. So I'm fine being called a sheep. That's all right. I'm fine with that. Because I want us to be a church full of sheep, all right? Can you imagine what our community would look like if we were a church full of sheep that are hearing the Lord's voice? Like, can you actually imagine that? What our city would look like if we were a church full of people who not just on Sunday, but Monday through Saturday, were hearing the voice of God. We're walking around and, and, and walking out our faith and, and living out of a place of Holy Spirit direction where we are on mission because we are hearing from the Lord daily. Like, that's crazy. Because to me, when I think about that, when I think about a church full of sheep that are hearing from the Lord daily, that are living on mission, to me that sounds like a spiritual revival in our city and a spiritual revival in our nation. That's where it starts. As a church full of people who are hearing from the Lord daily, and the Lord knows them. And they have discernment and they're on mission. That's what it sounds like to me. So we're, we're going to close out in, um, in a final song here. Um, I know that uh, I don't go quite as long as Matt. But as we close out in this final song, um, right, <laughs> I just, I just want to, to offer out a prayer here. Like if you don't know Jesus, Lord, right now in this moment, if there is somebody in here that has just been struggling with you, that doesn't know you, that doesn't have that relationship with you, I pray that you would just press on their spirit right now. I pray that you would press on their spirit in a way that is undeniable, 
that they can't stop thinking about you. They can't stop questioning what it is that what it means to be a follower of you. And if that's you, I would just encourage you in this last song, go back and talk to Zach or Adrienne. Jesus, I just pray that you lay your spirit on them so heavy right now. And if you do know Jesus in this spot right now, you guys can stand, we'll get ready to worship. But if you do know Jesus, I just pray as, as we go through this last song here that you would just do a little self-examining, all right? That you would look for any of those areas where you might be pulling back, where you yourself might feel like you're separated from God, and you would understand and realize that's it, that's in your mind. You there's no there's no gap there. We've, he's closed the gap. There's no separation to be had there. All you have to do is remember what you know to be true about Him and take Him at His word. So let's do some self-examining here in this last moment that we're we're together today. Let's be a church full of sheep that hear directly from the Lord and know what he's saying to us. Does that sound good? All right, let's worship, guys.